The Birth Circle podcast features experts in all the nuanced areas of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum with the aim of helping women make the choices that will keep them safe, healthy, and empowered. We respect all birth choices and believe in supporting informed consent and evidence-based practices. Nothing said on this podcast should be taken as medical advice. You should always seek the advice of a competent professional for your care. Welcome to the Birth Circle podcast. This is Sarah with Birth Circle, and today I have Nikki Shahid with me. And Nikki is one of the co owners of Birthing From Within International, and she leads trainings for birth professionals all over the world. She's been birth- working as a birth mentor and a doula in San Antonio since 2012, and she's guided hundreds of families and birth professionals across the threshold of birth. I love how you call it a threshold, mm-hmm. and has captured her ability to help people find their inner wisdom and self compassion in her new book, Heart Centered Pregnancy Journal. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. We're going to be talking about um, a transformation of the heart and what happens at birth, what's possible. So tell me how you got your start in this. How did you start into the birth world? You know, after my second child was born, I was just kind of feeling uh, like I had lost touch with myself and like I needed something just for me. And I had taken birthing from within classes when I was pregnant and thought they were kind of neato. And so I flew all the way to Vancouver, British Columbia to take my training. And what I thought I was going to learn was how to teach people to give birth the right way and avoid some of the pitfalls. Well, yeah, because there's only a right way, right? I mean, one right way, one right right way. So, so (laughs) now you're going to tell us what it is. Yeah. So then what I learned was that there's actually not one right way and that maybe just maybe there's more value in focusing on creating self-compassion and flexibility in parents prenatally because birth is a journey into the unknown. And so I sort of feel like I stumbled into this rabbit hole and it was so delicious. I was like, oh my gosh, I want more. And I took the course that Birthing From Within offered. Yeah. You kind of then start binging. Binging Absolutely. on birth education. So podcast. this podcast is part of people's binge. Just binge all things birth. So how many babies do you have? I have three kiddos of my own. They are four, nine, and 11. And did you have them in a various different ways or did you follow a certain type of? I sure did. Yeah. Um, my first, I was planning my beautiful, peaceful, natural birth and gave birth by cesarean and was um, shocked and disappointed and it took some time to really try to sort out what happened and what does that mean about me? Because we are such meaning maker, meaning making creatures, we humans, that mm-hmm. you know, automatically we start to spin a story. And I had uh, a lot of self judgment after that birth. And so mm. I said, okay, I'm going to try and get it right the second time around. Um, so the second time around, I went with the birth center and I took birthing from within and I had a doula and uh, wound up transporting to the hospital and um, sort of being coerced into having an epidural rather than having a cesarean birth. So while I had my VBAC, um, I did not have the birth that I was hoping for. And in retrospect, I feel like that was such a gift because if that birth had gone just the way I wanted it to, I, I would be giving people the recipe for how to do birth the right way and how to have the perfect birth. Um, but really, I had some more learning to do mm. about having compassion for myself, right? And knowing that we can influence birth, but we can't control birth. But what we can do is take a look at the stories we create in response to birth and try to craft a more compassionate story going into it. So by the time I had my third at home, I really felt like I was going to be okay no matter how my baby came out. Mm. Yeah, and so that's what you're teaching now is to be okay with that? Yes. To be okay with yourself. It doesn't mean that you have to be like, yay, I had just the birth I didn't want to have. But my hope for parents is that they don't then have a negative meaning about themselves because it carries over into the way that we parent, the way that we interact with others, and the way that we relate to ourselves. That's a good point. So you talk about you help people find their inner wisdom. Well, what is your inner wisdom and how do you navigate what your wisdom is and what your paranoia, anxiety, trauma brain says to you? 
Yeah, that's such a good question. And, and really, that's so much of what I'm trying to help people look at is the story, right? Taking apart that story so that they can then put it back together. So we're looking at um, not just stories about birth and early impressions about birth, which really do leave a lasting impression on us, but also what are your early stories about asking for help? What do you believe mm. to be true about being whiny or making noise? Right. Ouch. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. There, there are all these tangential pieces that don't feel like they're directly connected to birth. And yet when we hear, um, you know, you need to advocate for yourself, you need to speak up for yourself. Most of us were not raised with that kind of conditioning that would get you sent to your room without dessert or sent to the principal's office. Yeah. Right. And so if we can start to bring that into our awareness, then we have more choice where before there was just conditioning and kind of habitual patterning. Now we can say, oh, I see what's happening here. There's a belief coming up that was imprinted on me a long time ago. And maybe I am still going to go with that. But now I also have an option to move in a different direction if I want to. Yeah. Okay. But in the moment, it's really, really hard to kind of, even not being pregnant, sometimes it's hard for me to go, okay, what part of this is fear-based and what part of this is my intuition that comes from my heart? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a chapter on that, right? Um, about starting to notice the difference between fear and intuition because they are so close together and they're very hard to distinguish from one another, right? But one of the things we can do is check in with our body, right? And is the decision you're making, does it feel like it's coming from your belly or from like a grounded place? Or is it up here? Is it tense? Is it tight? Is it in my throat and my shoulders? Because that's a different kind of energy, right? Or do I have an attachment to a certain outcome? Am I trying to not have the nurse dislike me? Is that why I'm making this decision? Mm. Right? So we start to just kind of slow down that film reel a little bit um, to help people take a closer look at how those beliefs impact us. And you're so right. If you wait until the birth, it's going to be very hard to do that. Right? So I want parents prenatally to start practicing that awareness. And I want them to start practicing in small, safe ways, how to maybe do something different. Right. Give us so an it, example. Yeah. So it might feel like a big leap to say to your, um, to your doctor, you know, I don't agree with this, or this doesn't feel comfortable to me, but it's less of a big leap. Many of us are on a lot of zoom meetings right now. It's less of a leap to say, I'm going to speak up in this zoom meeting when ordinarily I would stay quiet. Right. And it starts to rewrite the story of I can't stand up to authority figures or I can't use my voice because we do these little experiments that show us, well, maybe it is safe mm -hmm. and maybe there's a little bit more that I can do. Right. So you're just flexing those muscles that maybe haven't been very flexed very much before to build it up in preparation for birth and parenting. So it feels like so many times we see birth as something to defend against that we see the media portraying birth as something scary. And then we hear these stories about these mean, awful OBs that do all these rape and pillage and, and all these terrible things. And we think, oh, we have to go in in a defensive mode. And, and, but it's more than that. It's also being able to transcend, like you said, birth is a, trans, a transformation. Like yeah. to go into the birth and not just keep myself safe, but also be whole through the entire experience. Mm. So how do we help, how do, how, it, it seems like birthing from within would, would be able to help somebody go from that place of defense. Uh, the, defen the defense is great, right? I mean, we need, <laughs> step one is defend yourself against predatory attacks, whether in birth or not, right? But step two is completely transforming, transforming who I am through this experience, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm hearing two different kind of distinct threads here. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, I need to feel safe in that, in this environment, right? Part of that is that it's important to assess beforehand. Is there something getting in the way of me feeling safe in my birth environment? Right. And some people you ask, how did you choose your midwife? How did you choose your doctor? And they'll say, oh, I've been seeing them since I was 18. Or my mom saw this person, so I see them too, 
right? Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's that conditioning and it's that habit that's setting people up in this relationship. But is that actually what they're seeking? And does that person provide what they're seeking? Right. So it's important to suss that out prenatally. What about this relationship is working for me and what is not? And if it's not, then how do I explore my own story about what I need to do next? Right. How do I explore my story about my interactions with my doctor and start to or my midwife and start to practice uh, interacting in a new way with them? Right. It's my belief that it's not a birthing person's responsibility to advocate for themselves in birth. And I know that might sound like, what? What are you saying? But if we think about the hormone cycle, right? And if we think about that dreamy state that people need to get into in order to feel less pain and intensity and have the oxytocin and endorphins flowing and lose track of time, that does not align with having an argument with yep. someone in the middle of labor, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we need to set it up to the best of our ability in such a way that the people around us are creating some protection. We have created some internal self-protection against internalizing anything negative that could happen to us. Right. And, and we also have that flexibility to maneuver through the journey without attachment to outcome, meaning that I'm not going to tell myself I'm a failure if it doesn't go the way that I'm hoping it does. And I'm not going to tell myself I'm a failure if I have an unpleasant interaction with somebody in my birth space, right? I'm going to come in with this understanding that I am human and they are human. And that doesn't mean that what goes on in the birth space is okay. But it does mean that it is not the responsibility of the birthing person to prevent that or to have some kind of... Um, I don't know, like powerful response to that. I, it just doesn't align with the vulnerability of birth. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And we can just think of, you know, it's not a, a kindergartner's responsibility to keep yourself safe against a teacher. It's not a baby's responsibility. It's the same thing. Like you exactly. are in a position in your life where you can't, you can't advocate for yourself. And I remember that I, yeah, I remember having an argument with one of my providers during one of my births and being like in my head going, why are we doing this now? You right. already know what I believe and what I want. Why, why are we having this now? I, it almost felt like she had just, uh-huh, 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 during the prenatals. But when yeah. push came to shove, she knew she'd get her way while I was in labor because what am I going to do at that point? Yes. Yes. And I think a lot of the, the cultural response is like, well, then I need to go into this and I need to be tough and I need to be ready to stand up and to yeah. fight. Um, and I think ideally what I need to do prenatally is find a provider who's a better fit. Now, there is some privilege involved in that, right? Not everyone can say, oh, I'm just going to go and get this person who's out of network for my insurance, right? Not everyone has that ability. And so it's also important to find um, people who can support you within that space, family members, friends, a doula. It's important for people to have culturally competent care to reduce the risk of uh, racism affecting the kinds of care that people get or uh, anti-LGBTQ sentiment affecting the kind of care that people get. So if you're not able to choose a provider who can really align with you on those things, then it is important to bring someone else into that birth space who can help to advocate for you and stand mm -hmm. up for you when what you need to be doing in that moment is be vulnerable. Yep, yep. Vulnerable to yourself, not to everybody else, but be, go, be able to go inside and let the work be done that your body exactly. needs to do. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then the other thing is you mentioned the transformation, right? So it's my belief that we're always transformed by birth. Like every single one of my births transformed me even though two, th two thirds of them went really differently from the way that I was hoping, right? I was a different person on the other side of that. And I learned something new about myself because each time I stepped into the unknown and I met the unexpected, and that includes in my home birth, right? Mm -hmm. Even there, I stepped into the unknown and I met the unexpected and somehow I had to find my way through. And because you are journeying into the unexpected, you can't possibly have all the answers beforehand. That's a good right? point. So that, trans that transformation comes when you somehow find your way through. 
And that may be in a way that feels like, yeah, this is what I was hoping to do. And that may be in a way that feels really different from what you were hoping, right? And then it, it becomes a matter of, am I going to use this against myself and judge myself for something that I couldn't have known was going to happen? Or am I going to use this to explore what I was holding uh, in a place of judgment and allow more of that into my life so that I can be more whole? as a result of this experience, no matter, you know, what the events are that unfolded. So do you feel like there's equal amount of work before and after, after the birth to process, to prepare and process? I would say so. Yes. I mean, my, my hope is that this can get into people's hands so that they can start to do some of that work prenatally, right. And sort of do some preventative measures to the disappointment or even trauma that can come up. Yeah. from experience. Well, it just seems like we say, prepare for your birth, prepare for your birth. And then after we go, oh, you just need a nap. But to actually sit down and like process your birth, you're saying you learn so much about yourself. That's all like during and after work. That's not prenatal work. Like you said, you can't go in with all the answers. Right. So you're saying that birthing from within, like this whole thing, it goes way past birth. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, as I mentioned before, when we were talking about using your voice or asking for help. There are so many broad strokes in birth that if we can start to look at some of the broad strokes and some of the things that people say, it's okay to do this, but it's not okay to do that about birth prenatally and start to inquire, well, why is that? Mm -hmm. Where does that idea come from? And what is it you could give yourself permission to do, even if it's not your first choice, right? What are the cards that you can still leave on the table so that we can address some of that prenatally. um, And then hopefully that, that learning and that awareness spills over into the postpartum period when, like you said, there will be all of that processing. Yeah. But not even just spill over, but like a conscious understanding that you're going to be working postpartum in processing your birth. (laughs) So that's a subject we haven't really talked about. Mm, That would be really fun to dive into is the actual art of processing your birth. Yeah. Because everybody has to do it, whether it's a positive birth or, or a negative birth in the person's eyes, they, they still like so much processing or I wonder if this had happened or I'm so glad that happened or. Yeah. You know, in birthing from within, we look at birth as a heroic journey, right? And it's a a term that was coined by Joseph Campbell to describe this storyline that we can see all throughout history, right? From biblical stories to the never ending story to Moana, we see this story pattern play out again and again. And one of the key pieces of the heroic journey is the one forbidden thing, right? So the person who is undergoing an initiation must do one forbidden thing, something that they learned in their early conditioning they cannot do, they should not do, if they want to remain uh, in rapport with others, if they want to be lovable, if they want to belong, they have to do, yeah, they have to do that forbidden thing in order to get through that initiation and be transformed. And so when it comes to processing your birth afterwards, you can really look at what was the forbidden thing, right? And many of us can probably call it up very quickly. Uh, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I hadn't gone along with this. I wish I hadn't said this thing, right? And then to look at, but what is the early belief that that's attached to, right? About who I'm supposed to be as a person to be lovable. And then you can look over at your baby and say, what is it they need to do to be lovable? What is it they need to do to be worthy? Like, are you talking about a brand new baby? Your your brand new baby, yeah. Wow. Nothing, right? So no. what is the difference? What is the difference between that parent and their baby? A bunch of stories that they heard along the way. Exactly. And so if you can unpack how did that get to be a forbidden thing? And what if that actually has value in my life? Right? And can I allow myself to be more whole by Um, making space for both this expression and that expression. Can I bring both the light and the shadow into my life? That's how we really begin that healing process. Wow. And so talk about the role of self-compassion in all this. I mean, it's everything. (laughs) It's just everything because, you know, we're learning how to exist in the world, 
as we're growing up. We're learning how to get along and we're learning how to not be left out by our peers or not invited back to my prenatal yoga group, right? Like so much of it is about relationship. And we believe that we have to tick off certain boxes or meet a certain bar in order to still be in relationship with people. Totally. Worthy, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can start to source that from within, then we don't have to look to the outside to get someone else's approval because what a roller coaster ride that is, right? Well, this person agrees with me, that person validated me, but oh man, that person at the supermarket who I don't even know put me down and said I should have done it a whole different way. So my hope for parents is to just step off of that roller coaster as much as possible and say, how can I bring love to myself? How can I tap into my inherent worth and my inherent lovability before, during, and after birth? Uh, there's, there's a part of me that's heard the, the rhetoric or the, the teaching that basically having self-compassion is um, making excuses. Like why you should, I should have done this. And if I give myself compassion, it's like giving myself a pass. Yeah. I mean, I know that's not true, but, but in birth, it gets really intense. But it's like a pass for what? A pass for what? I mean, you are supposed to be vulnerable in birth. That's just the way it works. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I know that we try to like plan and hedge our bets and... (laughs) Do everything we can, but at the end of the day, it is a vulnerable process. Yeah. So, I mean, what is it that we even need to ask forgiveness for? Right? Well, what can someone the, do in birth that could well, possibly and, be wrong? The hardest part of forgiveness is the self-forgiveness. The thought that, oh my gosh, I I knew better. I knew that I should have stood up to the midwife for this or the OB, and they still did it, and now my baby suffers or I suffer because of this. And I didn't, I didn't stand up for myself. I didn't get the right doula or my partner wasn't informed enough because I didn't do it right. I didn't take the right class. And if you say, well, I was doing the best I could in the moment I could, like, it almost sounds like, um, like, like, you can't just change your whole heart and your whole belief about self-forgiveness in that one moment. Yeah. It's true. I mean, it has to happen afterwards, right? Like the dust Mm -hmm. has to settle. We can't even process until weeks after the birth, really, because as I said, the dust is settling and you're really still in the ordeal. And it can't, it can't be, you know, a bumper sticker affirmation, like I did my best without. Right. That's what what I'm talking about. That's what it feels like. And if you do that, then it feels like you're just giving yourself a pass. And that's what I'm saying. Then the guilt comes back in. Right. Yeah. So the bumper stickers are not helpful. They're not right? helpful. <laughs> it's not helpful. Um, but what is helpful is to look at, but where did it come from? Where did it come from? This idea that this is who I'm supposed to be. What stood in the way? What stood in the way, right? Like the example you gave, I should have stood up to that person. Well, why didn't that happen? Did it not happen because you were a weak person or did it not happen because again and again and again, it was reinforced in your life that you are safer if you remain quiet? Mm -hmm. I've certainly had a story like that. And if you think about writing on a pad of paper with a pencil, right, you write something down in the next few pages, you can still see that imprint. It's true. This is how it is with our beliefs as Mm -hmm. well, right? And even if we read in a book like, oh yeah, advocate for yourself and stand up for yourself, you know, we can feel like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do this. If there has been no, uh, no excavation of what might get in the way of me doing that, then it could be very difficult to do in birth. That's true. That's true. Birth, like you said way before, Birth is not the time to do the work. You have to do it. A lot of it started prenatally, if not before. Ideally, we're raised with this. (laughs) That'd be nice, right? Our our baby daughters, how many girls do you have in that mix? Two. Two. Yeah, hopefully our daughters are not having to process things. Their podcasts sound way different in 20 years than ours. I certainly hope so. I I certainly hope so. Yeah, because there's just, uh, there are hundreds of years of culture um, handed down, just expectations. And when you unravel just these deep things. I mean, just even something as simple as um, you will probably throw up at some point in your labor and that is completely normal and biologically great. (laughs) And yet we have this like shame and embarrassment about throwing up. Like, oh, come on, really? I mean, if that's the most, you know, 
then we're not even getting in, into the other things like breastfeeding in public or, or any of the other things that even could be more a sensitive topic. Or the emotional spectrum. Right? Yeah. Like normalized beforehand. Like you will probably have moments of excitement, like, oh my gosh, labor's starting and I'm going to meet my baby. And you'll probably have moments of doubt. And you'll probably have moments of overwhelm and love and connection and fear, right? Like all of this is a normal part of that process. And so the more that we can normalize before birth, the easier it is for parents to walk into that journey with self compassion. Yeah, there we go. The more it's normalized, the easier it is to have self-compassion because then it's not about what I should have, could have done. It's this is what happened and why. Yeah. I always say in my classes, I don't like to shoot on people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's really good. Well, there's a lot of shoulds. I mean, even I've seen women who are the most, what I think the most empowered beings there are. And then in the throes of labor, they become so doubtful of everything they're doing. And it's like, but you know this stuff, my friend, you know this stuff. Yeah. So then they're just upheld by the, the team that they've surrounded themselves with because of yeah. course, we're not gonna let them keep thinking that. <laughs> Knock that out of your head right now. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> In a very empowered way, we do that, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, but I mean, there it is, right? The one forbidden thing, like the part of you that has been put in the shadow. Mm. So if you go around in your everyday life, you know, and you are like, I am empowered. I use my voice. I get stuff done. Then the part that comes out in birth, maybe the part that feels scared or overwhelmed, or I actually don't have my stuff together. Yep. Right. And then how do we create space for that prenatally? So it doesn't feel like a failure when they're giving birth. Yeah. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about, um, the birthing from within program itself. I've gotten to interview the creators and founders of many different educational programs all over the world. And what I love, it's like me and dark chocolate. Oh, I love the chocolate that's made in Poland. There's a, there's an Icelandic brand that I love. And then there's a Swiss brand. I just love. And the more I learn about these birth modalities, the more I feel like you're all just different brands of the same, of, of gourmet chocolate. So yeah. what is birthing from within? What is your secret sauce? What is, what is the, yeah, tell me more about the program and how it works. Yeah, I mean, a big part of the secret sauce is the framework of the heroic journey. Because when birth is framed as a heroic journey, and this is for our educators, not necessarily for the parents we work with, right? But when educators and doulas can understand the way that early conditioning is the first phase of the heroic journey, right? The birth preparation does not start with a positive pregnancy test or your first birth class or anything like that. But really prenatal preparation starts from the time that you can start to form sentences and make sense of the world. Oh, I'd say it starts when you're born. Like it your own well birth, right? your own, I've heard that your own birth influences how you birth. Yeah. Both yeah. encouraging and discouraging at the same time. <laughs> I know. So what are the pieces we can do something about, right? Right. So if we can look back at the first stories we ever heard about birth, mm -hmm. right? And think about how does that still show up for me today, right? How does that influence my thinking today, whether I am an expecting parent or whether I'm a birth professional, how do those early ideas impact me? Right. And then at, at what point did I hear a call, hear a call to go and explore another part of myself? Right. What were the phases that I went through where there was a shedding of ideas? And I think we can all identify with that in birth. Right. We pass over these thresholds where mm -hmm. there is a shedding of I thought it would be like this. Right. And then we move on and then we get to the next threshold and there's another shedding. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. I thought it was going to be oh like my that. Gosh. Oh my gosh. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Calling these, instead of calling these big, scary, fearful moments, traumatic, call them thresholds because everything could be a threshold. Oh, I thought my partner would be overjoyed and they're not. That's a threshold. Oh, I thought I would be overjoyed. I thought I'd bond with this pregnancy and I'm not. That's a threshold. Threshold. That's right. Oh, I thought I would stay fit and thin the whole time. And look, I'm struggling with my sugars. That's a threshold. Like everything's a threshold. <gasps> all these shifts, blown. right? <laughs> yeah. All of these shifts. And that's the transformation is all of those shifts that happen and all of the ways that we kind of fall apart. 
the ways that our ideas about ourselves fall apart in labor, right? And then the way it gets pieced back together afterwards. So after we do the one forbidden thing and we meet our baby, right? And then we hear a call. We hear a call to wholeness. We hear a call to come back to ourselves. That's when we start to put those pieces back together and say, gee, I had a story before that it meant this about me and it meant that about me, right? And those things that fell apart were felt very much like a part of my identity. But who am I now? Who am I now? And what is the truer, more compassionate story I want to write about myself as I go forward as a parent? Right. Yeah. So having that context of the heroic journey shifts everything in the way that people interact with birth. That's a good point. And at that point, it's not about getting it right or getting it wrong. Right. It's about bringing curiosity to, well, I wonder what shifts will happen for me. I wonder what thresholds I will have to cross rather than trying to avoid them. That's a great point. Plan around that. There's nothing wrong with curiosity. You can't have a wrong curiosity or a right curiosity. So if you approach the, the thresholds with curiosity, man, okay, just shake all the language up here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Curiosity. I wonder what would happen if I learned a little bit more about V-backs or I wonder what would happen if, well, I know I did not want a birth tub. I thought that sounded disgusting. And my husband's like, Hey, I wonder, I wonder if we had a birth tub, if I could support you better. I wonder if like we would feel closer if we had a birth tub. And I was like, well, now you put it that way. (laughs) And I'm so grateful he wondered because I loved my water birth. Yeah, and anywhere you notice rigidity within yourself, whether you're a parent or a birth pro, that's the space to bring that curiosity. Where does this come from? How do I know this to be true? And what else might be true alongside this? Right? Yeah, yeah. And what also what I think is true, but really isn't. Because again, back to what you said, like what do we bring from our culture, from our upbringing? That's really not true. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And if we start to think of them as fairy tales, right, or, or something we read about somebody else's belief system, then we can create some separation. We're not over identified with those beliefs. And we see this a lot with postpartum parents, right? They'll say, oh, I can have, you know, I can say somebody else did an okay job, you know, where that they were enough, but I can't give it to myself. Mm-hmm. So even prenatally, right, to start to look at those beliefs as a story. It is just a story that got passed on to you, Yeah. right? Now there's more space between me and that belief. Yeah. Okay, so how does one um, then, you say birth is not the time or the place for you to defend your own stuff and to be an advocate for yourself. So how does one then take all of this, what you're saying, this, this, these, these, more clear beliefs, this, this thought of transformation, this curiosity, how then do they form their birth team and find their ideal provider? Mm. Well, one of the things I encourage people to do in the book is to set an intention. And for some people, it feels scary to set an intention because they get so much judgment. Well, there you go. Then what, what you should have. Well, I want this. My intention is that I will be undisturbed in labor. <gasps> But what if that offends the doctor? What if that offends my mom? What if, you know, right? right. That's what you're saying. So right. even setting intention can be scary sometimes. Or even the folks who say, I want to do it unmedicated. What, you know, what is the response they're often met with? Oh, you're going to be screaming for the epidural. Yeah, that's so cute. Right. And it, exactly. And it makes people afraid to set an intention. And I hear so much like, well, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Well, that's not good either. Well, right. I mean, it, it makes you very vulnerable in an environment where a where having an epidural happens most of the time, right? And if that's like, yeah, I would like to do that, then that Great. works well. Totally. But right? if you walk into an environment where these things happen most of the time and you're like, ah, I don't know. Well, it's like I if you hire somebody to build a house for you and they're like, well, what kind of color would you like your cabinets? And you're like, I don't, I don't know, maybe you should try this. And they're like, well, does it match your flooring? And you're like, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see what the flooring guy brings. Like, what What are you supposed to do? <laughs> right. And then the flooring guy is going to bring what works for him. Right. Right. What's well, worked well for him. And that might not work well for you. And then is he wrong for bringing that flooring? No. And, and actually, this happened. I, I was just overwhelmed. I needed a bathroom remodeled. And the tile guy said he had some nice gray tile. And I said, great. Just do the gray tile. And I arrived. And I was like, ooh, not the gray yeah. tile I would have picked. Well, who's to blame right. there? Like, 
I just went right. with it, but it's done. Done is better than perfect sometimes. Right. <laughs> right. But not so when, you clear, <laughs> when you're clear about your intention, then you can ask yourself, well, why is this important to me, right? So for one, you can build a team that supports that intention enthusiastically, right? That doesn't tolerate, like you said, a VBAC, um, but it's like, yeah, I enthusiastically enthusiastically support VBACs. But what you can also do is look at, well, why is this important to me? Mm -hmm. And maybe it's, um, I want to bond with my baby, Mm -hmm. right? And then we can begin to get curious about, okay, if things look differently from how I want them to look, if my baby needed to go to the NICU, how can I still find ways to bond with my baby, right? What can I do now? to start to create and foster that bond? And then what can I do even if they need to be away from me to support that bond? So the more we can expand the conversation about self-compassion and also about ways to cope, then the more that parents have to draw from as they go into that birth experience. It also goes the other way if you want, not the other way, but if you want an epidural or if you want a a C-section, then you should probably be picking a provider that again, supports that too. I've seen moms who say, I don't want to feel a thing. Like I would like this managed for me. I want to feel like everything's under control and in your capable hands. And then they, they hire a doula that's super natural, super. And then that doula un, unwittingly like pushes her biases on this mom. Like, oh, you can stay home a little longer. And the mom's like, no, I want to go. She's like, no, you can stay home a little longer. So it goes both ways. We usually hear like people trying to avoid drugs and avoid stuff, but it also goes the other way. Somebody can be traumatized by not being able to get the epidural fast enough or not getting the C-section when they asked for the C-section. And so I just want to just throw that out there that it really, what you said, set an intention. If your intention is, I do not want to feel a thing. Well, then you need to understand what not feeling a thing means because they don't give you an epidural to, you know, six centimeters, whatever. But, but then go, go find provider that and work that out and figure out what that means to you, right? Yeah, and it's so interesting to look at it through the lens of conditioning as well because I've worked with people who said, yeah, you know what, I think I want a VBAC. And just through the course of their birth experience, it became clear to me as their doula, they actually really didn't. Right. And, and did not deliver with a VBAC. And so here I am like pushing this uphill, like, okay, here's how we get ready for a VBAC. And what I realized later, I wish I had realized it sooner was it came down to belonging. Right. Because when they would say, I want a VBAC, everyone around them, including me, unfortunately would say, oh, yay. Good for you. Right. Oh, that's interesting. But she really didn't want a VBAC. She really didn't want a VBAC. But when we look at that conditioning, how do I get my needs met? How do I feel lovable and worthy? Because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. And there's such a focus in birth on data and information right now. But we forget that if people don't feel safe, if they don't feel loved, if they don't feel a sense of belonging, that data doesn't mean anything. Wow. Wow, that's big. That a sense of belonging can drive choices. Okay, so now we've got in t- intuition <laughs> and self-compassion along with a balance of um, feeling of self, of, of acceptance and belonging. That's right. that's right. Wow. And that's a lot of th- times people, oh, that, that explains why so many people feel like, oh, in my next birth, because we talk about natural unmedicated birth as just the transcendent experience as a transcendent experience. And, and then subtly, we, unless you had that kind of birth, you can't possibly know what that transcendence feels like. Right. That's, that's really unfair. <laughs> it's unfair and it's also untrue. Yeah, it's, it's also, very untrue. Right? I mean, yeah. if we see it as a heroic journey, then whether it's in a hospital or home or a birth center, whether there's an epidural involved, there's an induction, there's no medication, you are still going through a personal transformation. You are still becoming a parent. And I don't care what happened in there, you're not going to be the same person on the other side, right? Oh, I love it. Yes. This is the most validating, for any birth outcome you have, this is the most validating perspective, this this hero's journey perspective. Absolutely. And it probably helps going into it with this perspective 
And through the birth, it also probably helps with postpartum recovery more quickly as well when you can That's right. frame That's it this right. way, right? When, when you've got that framework, right, then you understand better how to support your clients postpartum. And it's not with, oh, you can do it, you can do it the right way next time, you know, and it's not like with what we talked about, the bumper sticker affirmations, right? But yeah. it's really digging into this brought something to the surface for you. It brought something to the surface for you. And now yeah. is the chance to look at like, what is it that needs to be healed and reconciled there? Yeah. And it also takes the guilt and the shame off yourself, because if you can go, come from a place of, um, if you're saying, well, I made the wrong decision, I shouldn't have let him do that, or I should have, should have, should, if you can go then, um, the provider hurt me, or the system betrayed me, or, yeah. and it just, not that that's a ton more helpful, but it is, it, it takes away the guilt and the shame, and you said, it becomes a transformative experience when you say, oh, the system hurt me. And here's what I learned from the system hurting me. Instead of saying, I didn't prepare. I'm such a putz. Um, I'm a dork. You yes. know? <laughs> I, yeah. I'm unworthy because the system hurt me, right? Like, Yeah. Oh, that, you can even say that sentence. I'm unworthy because the system hurt me. Like those two ideas don't even go together. Exactly. I am who I am because the system hurt me. It's like, yeah, I learned a lot. <laughs> right? right? Right. Yep. And when you do, you know better, you do better. And then you can approach your sisters and your friends' births a lot differently as well. Instead of saying, oh, well, you don't want to do that because this will happen. You can come from a place of, this is what I learned. I'm so excited to see what you learn and like open space for them, right? That's right. And I'm, I'm curious about your journey. And I'm curious about your, your conditioning as well. Because conditioning isn't all about, you know, the, the harmful patterns we internalize. But you've also learned strategies and ways of coping and getting through difficult situations throughout your conditioning as well, right? Yeah. So every parent has like this wealth of information and experience and embodiment that they can tap into. They can tap into to learn more about themselves and how they can best uh, traverse that journey. It's very fascinating. So um, where most most people that pick birthing from within where are they what is their starting point what are they searching for that birth from, birthing from within fills for them there are a lot of people who come to us who actually are already doulas or may already be childbirth educators and um, they'll say things to us like i took this training and then i gave the parents all the information and yet they still had an experience that they were disappointed with right? Like it was only as deep as the data. Mm -hmm. And so what they're searching for, what they're finding in birthing from within is something that goes deeper than the data, something that is more personal than the data. Right? Very cool. And then after they're done, what do they say about the program? How did it help them in the most effective way? Well, what they say is that it changed their lives. Right. I mean, I can say that if I never taught another birthing from within class, if I never went to another birth, I will be forever changed because of birthing from within, right? Because of these tools of self compassion and introspection that I've had the opportunity to apply to myself, I am now forever changed. And so I, as a birth professional, am also less likely to suffer trauma. Ooh, that is cool. Very, very cool. Because birth, birth professional trauma is real too. Secondary yes. trauma. Yeah. There's so much burnout in birth. So much burnout. Yes. I know I say if we could just keep these passionate birth workers in business <laughs> and help with burnout, then more birthing families would be blessed by them. Because if you have this turnover every, every year or so, we have a brand new crop of doulas and midwives coming in. It, you don't get the... Um, I don't know, passed on wisdom. What is the, what is the word? Just, you don't build up a massive culture and support. Yes, it's true. And I mean, that's why our crossing the threshold retreat, we've nicknamed the burnout busting retreat. Ooh. Right? Yeah. It's taking everything that birthing from within gives to parents and applying it to birth professionals. Right. I mean, it's this solve for the soul um, to, to really take that time to focus on yourself and on your own heroic journey 
as an individual, as a parent, if you're a parent, and as a birth professional, right? So that you can also have more self-compassion on your yeah. own journey as you support parents. Wow. Yes. Okay. So how do people find you, both uh, um, birthing birthing people and uh, professionals? How do they yeah. tap into so the, if, all the, the great resources? So if you go to birthingfromwithin.com, you will find a directory of birth pros for parents if they want to find a childbirth educator, a doula. I mean, we have midwives, we have IBCLCs in our midst. We have all kinds of amazing people all around the globe um, who are supplying birthing from within for parents. And then we also have trainings for birth pros listed on that website. So we've got Crossing the Threshold, which is the beautiful retreat that I told you about. We have our doula and childbirth educator. Um, certification program there. And we have a lot of continuing education too. We have mindful communication, birth art, business basics for birth pros. So there's really something for everybody there. Very cool. And your book um, is the Heart Centered Pregnancy Journal. And where can they get that? You can get that on Amazon. And you can also get uh, Heart Centered Pregnancy Deck on Amazon now too. Ooh, what is the deck? So it takes chapters from the book and turns them into, oh, look, intention, short <laughs> prompt that parents can reflect on. And it's also a lot of birth pros have been using this in prenatals and in childbirth education classes to help them connect with their clients more and help their clients start to look inward and really do that introspective work. Very, very cool. And the, the Heart Centered Pregnancy Journal goes along with the Birthing From Within curriculum. Absolutely. Yeah. But you can also do it without it, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So there just are a lot of areas where Birthing From Within isn't available, although um, all of the online classes that are happening now are making it more available. Yeah, I was going to say, COVID is actually a two-edged sword for our industry, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. Because it's making it more acceptable. I mean, I'm in San Antonio and I had a couple from New Jersey join one of my recent classes. Um, but for folks who, who cannot attend a birthing from within class, this is such a great sub supplement to your prenatal education to help you get that, that really juicy stuff. As you yeah. Get birth. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you. My and pleasure. if you have any question about anything Nikki said or want to reach her, um, didn't catch the website, you can always reach me at media at birthcircle.com. And again, check out Nikki's stuff and birthing from within. <laughs> just a little plug from Birthing Within. I just, it's a newer program, right? You guys, it's not. No, it's actually been around for 20 years. Okay. Well, compared to Bradley and hypnobirthing, then it's newer, right? And just taking the world by storm. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Please visit us at birthcircle.com, join our Facebook groups, or find us on Instagram and Pinterest. We hope you'll use our resources to support your birthing experience.